A little bit about myself, uh, we'll start. I, um, I married my high school sweetheart. Yeah, it's awesome. I'm not gonna show the picture. But um, no, I, uh, I met this girl uh, when I was a senior in high school and she's brand new to my school. And she was this gorgeous thing I'd never seen before. Went to this huge public high school and she just, God just put her on this stage about this big with this after school activity, this gorgeous girl. And I was like, oh, you know, like when you say, woo! Uh, so uh, I was like, okay, I have two choices. Um, I can let this beautiful angel walk out of my life forever, or I can swallow a volleyball of pride, walk across the stage, look her in the eyes, and ask her her name, because that's what a real man does. doesn't just text her or DM her or try and uh, insta her. Anyway. Um, so, <laughs> sorry, guys, you know, it's true. So I walk across the stage, and this is this wonderful, beautiful angel, and I said, you know, hi, you know, my name's Mark, what's your name? She tells me your name, and I said, I've never seen you here before. And she's like, yeah, I just moved to town. I'm like, oh, are you Christian? She's like, yeah. And I'm like, okay. <laughs> are you Catholic? And she's like, yeah. I'm like, one second, thank you. <laughs> I went back, I said, so where do you go to church? She's like, well, I, I literally just moved. And I said, come to Mass me this Sunday. And she said yes. <laughs> and now we've got four kids. And she's still the most beautiful woman I've ever seen in my life. It's awesome. It's awesome. So, but, 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 with marriage, with marriage, and any married person in the room will tell you, there's some give and take. Because when you get married, whatever she likes, you like. And whatever you like, doesn't matter. <laughs> so, for instance, like when I was a kid, I loved horror movies. I loved sci-fi. And then I married a woman who does not love horror movies, does not love sci-fi. But I finally, you know, we sat down, we'll choose movies, and whenever I choose a movie, she says, I don't like that. It's not realistic. <laughs> so we end up watching, you know, the movies she likes to, to watch. But I did get her to watch a horror movie with me a couple weeks back. It was, uh, let's see, where is it? Well, you'd like to know, wouldn't you? Let's go to it. <laughs> the movie was, <laughs> what? No. No, actually, it was The Notebook. This is, honestly, this is all I can say. That's, that's a horror movie, okay? Like she'll, she'll say to me, she's like, I don't want to watch Star Wars. Science fiction isn't real. I'm like, oh, but a world where Ryan Gosling can't get a girl is real? <laughs> Whatever. But see, when I was a kid, right, I loved horror movies. I mentioned this last night. I mean, Jaws terrified me. I didn't want to get in the bathtub. I didn't want to get in the pool. I didn't want to drink a cup of water. I was so scared. And that's, you know, a good horror movie can really freak you out. I mean, even a movie poster, right? Even a movie poster can freak you out in a horror movie. And then it doesn't even have to be anything like that's even like really scary, right? Like, whoever, whoever would have thought that Jim from The Office, I mean, come on, right? But you know what I love about horror movies is that, that a director, a writer, someone who's like thousands of miles away can can scare the living bejesus out of you when you're sitting in your house on your own couch, right? You're watching, and everybody's been in this, in this situation before, you're watching a horror movie, and you know, it's, like, it's, it's, like, it's like, I can't watch, I can't watch, I can't not watch. But anything can freak you out. You'd be sitting there, like, all of a sudden your phone will ring, you're like, what's that sound? It's the phone, it does that from time to time. Or you're watching it, you're all tense, and what's that sound? It's the ice maker, it goes off every hour, it has since you were a kid. And every, even in a horror movie, I mean, anything, even breathing can freak you out, right? I'll give me an example. Kill, 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 kill. Kill, 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 kill. You know what that was? That was some dude in a sound booth in L.A. who has asthma, just exhaling. <laughs> but it can freak you out. And then when you watch a horror movie, all of a sudden you realize, especially like if someone's going to go hunt down the murderer, you're like, you're an idiot. I am so much smarter than you are. What is happening, right? You have like some like teeny bopper girl, like she'll wake up and she'll be like, I'm all alone. Billy! Mike! Unnamed friend we brought along who died first. Okay, well, there's a big trail of sticky red stuff. And the electricity's out from the storm. And the phone line's cut. And I'm all alone. And I'm half naked. I'm gonna investigate. You don't go investigate, you investigate. <laughs> you die. <laughs> Whose idea was it? Like, who writes these things? You're sitting on the couch and you're like, you're gonna die. 
But that's why there's always the one friend who comes along, the funny unnamed friend at the very beginning, like carrying the cooler to the beach. You're like, he's going to die first. They didn't even give him a name. <laughs> Doesn't even have a name. But when you watch those movies, like I find myself, I'm like, I can't watch, but I can't not watch because, oh my gosh, how stupid are you? If you walk, walk into a pool of blood with no electricity and no phone line, you don't go forward to investigate. You hide. You hide and you wait for the bumbling sheriff to come and rescue you. Because that's reality. Very, very seldom, if there's a fearful situation, a scary situation, do you walk out and go investigate. What we naturally do is we naturally hide. It's our human nature because you want to preserve your life. Go back to the book of Genesis. After the fall, after you know, Adam and Eve are butt naked, they still got fruit juice running down their faces. And what happens? They hear God in the garden. So what do they do? They're like, I'm going to come investigate. No, they're like, no, they go and they hide. See, they, they sin. They choose themselves over God. They misuse this great gift of God, this gift he's entrusted to them, and then they go and they hide. Why? Out of fear. What does it say? Well, we heard you coming. We were scared, so we hid ourselves because we were naked. Like, if you get in trouble with your parents, do you walk in, Mom and Dad, <laughs> first speeding ticket. Yeah! <laughs> no. You try to hide it as long as you possibly can. I mean, before, before grades were getting emailed, I mean, I remember like, I would wait for that report card, man. <laughs> mom, did you get a report card? No, no, no. Well, Tommy's mom said he got his. I know, he's, yeah, that's what they do with people with bad grades. They give them first. <laughs> like, we hide. But then there's these beautiful moments, and I love scripture. Scripture, this is our greatest family heirloom. Okay, the Catholic Church is the church that actually put the Bible together. 73 books written over 1,500 years by 45 plus authors. This is one of the greatest gifts ever. And this has been entrusted to us. And sometimes we'll read scripture and we'll be like, oh, they came from the land of the Moabites, the Mosquito Bites, and the Gigabites. And you're like, eh. <laughs> this bites, all right? You know, there's nothing for me here. And sometimes we forget like, that these are timeless truths. And there's beautiful stories in scripture. And one such story occurs in the Gospel of Mark. And it's a famous story. You've probably heard it before, but I want to share it with you one more time. In the name of the Father, and the Son, and the Holy Spirit. Amen. A reading from the Gospel of Mark. He went off with him, and a large crowd followed him and pressed upon him. And there was a woman afflicted with hemorrhages for 12 years, a lot of internal bleeding. She had been suffering for 12 years. And she had suffered greatly at the hands of many doctors and had spent all that she had, yet she was not helped, but it only grew worse. She had heard about this Jesus and came up behind him in the crowd and touched his cloak. She said, if I but touch his clothes, I shall be cured. And immediately, St. Mark tells us, immediately her flow of blood dried up. She felt in her body that she was healed of her affliction. Jesus, aware at once the power had gone out from him, turned in the crowd and asked, who has touched my clothes? But his disciples said to him, you see how this crowd is pressing in on you, and yet you ask, who touched me? They're like, boss, look at this crowd. And he looked around to see who had done it. And the woman, realizing what had happened to her, approached in fear and trembling. Notice that fear did not make her hide. That fear, when she actually acknowledged it, propelled her to move forward. She fell down before Jesus and told him the whole truth. And he said to her, daughter, your faith has saved you. Go in peace and be cured of your affliction. Now, fear can do different things. See, sometimes fear makes us hide. In the Garden of Eden, they were filled with shame. They were filled with guilt. God said, don't do this. But they went and did it anyway. They chose themselves. So the natural recourse is, I'm going to go hide. It's like if, if you're a kid and you break something in the house and you hide the evidence because you don't want mom and dad to get mad at you. But you see, this woman is so filled with suffering and she's been basically just, just completely cast aside by society because the blood, the hemorrhaging made her unclean ritualistically, which means that she couldn't be part of the community. She had to live separately. She had to be outside of the community because she was seen as unclean. And, and that, so, so this is not just a physical ailment. This is an emotional ailment, a psychological ailment. She is completely without community. She's completely alone. She feels emotionally abandoned, like socially abandoned. And she's been suffering like this for 12 years. And then she hears about this Jesus guy. She's thinking, if there's any chance, this guy, any chance at all, that he could heal me, but see, she's unclean. So if she touches him, then by Jewish law, then she makes him unclean. But she knows that there's something different about this carpenter, this guy from Nazareth. She's been hearing about him. So she gets into the throngs of people, into the crowds. She enters into the crowd, which would have been hard enough for her. 
She was scared she'd be rejected, pushed away, told to leave. She wasn't filled with guilt or with shame, but she did feel alone and turned in on herself. But you see, she was motivated. She was motivated by her faith. Her faith actually moved her because faith is more powerful than fear. It says in 2 Timothy 1.7, God did not give you a spirit of fear. He gave you a spirit of power and of love and of self-control. Power, love, and self-control. Oftentimes we go to God and we act like, God, I need you to give me more of this because I don't have it. I'm somehow lacking. God says, I've given you everything you need. I didn't give you that spirit of fear. Fear does not come from God. Fear comes from the evil one. Fear does not come from God. Fear comes within. Fear comes from sin and shame and darkness and selfishness and pride. That's where fear emanates from. That's where it grows. That's the soil for fear. It's our own sin, our own shame, our own darkness. And God wants to call you out of that sin and shame and darkness. And here her faith propels her. You know, courage is not the absence of fear. The word courage is a fascinating word. It comes in the Latin, core and ejere. Core, like your heart, like corazón, your heart. And ejere, which means to act. So to have courage, okay, in the face of fear, does not mean that you're not afraid. It means you're unwilling to let fear control you. You're unwilling to let you be mastered by your fear. To have courage means that you're going to act from your heart. You're going to act from your heart and not allow shame or darkness or fear to dictate your life anymore. That you're going to walk forward propelled in faith. That you're going to have confidence, word confidence, con fide, with faith. Then I'm going to walk forward in faith and trust that God is not going to turn his back on me. This woman has such faith that in the midst of being socially outcast, completely filled with shame, turned in on herself, she let her faith propel her. She had courage to walk forward and she merely just touches just the hem of his garment. Can you imagine? I always wondered, did the apostles like fight over Jesus' clothes on laundry day? I did the Sea of Galilee and like Bartholomew and Philip are like, dude, I'm doing his laundry today. I'm doing his laundry today. Beat it. Oh, I feel good. Can you imagine what went through this woman? I mean, it wasn't like a, hey, I touched the, the, the garment, you know, come back in six months, we'll take an x-ray. It says immediately she was healed. What does this teach us about God? Well, number one, he's got the power. Number two, when you go to God in a humble boldness like she did, he will respond. That he'll give you what you need. He might not always give you what you want, but he'll give you everything you need. But when God says, ask and you shall receive, seek and you shall find, knock and it'll be open to you, Matthew 7, 7. When God says this, you know, all three of those things have in, in common, asking, seeking, knocking, effort. That you've got to put in the effort. That you can choose to live in fear, to live in darkness, to live in shame, to pull back, separate yourself. Because that's what sin does. Sin separates us. You see, grace is God's life in us. God's life in us. That's what the sacraments give us is grace, God's life. But sin is a disgrace. It pushes out his divine life. And that's why it's so important that we have this gift of reconciliation and confession in the church because God transforms that sin into grace through the power of his priesthood. But see, you still have to have the guts like this woman to walk forward. And one of the greatest modern traps that the evil one uses to try to enslave us is our sexuality. He takes something good and he twists it into something bad. You know, if you go back to the Garden of Eden, it didn't say that the fruit was bad. It actually says it was good. It says it was good. It was pleasing to the eye. It was a good thing. So what did the devil do? He got in, he twisted it just a little bit. He turned a good thing into a potentially bad thing. And he got them to choose themselves and not to trust God and God's plan. And he's still doing that today. And one of the most prevalent ways the devil does that today is through pornography. This is not just a guy thing. It's not just a girl thing. It's an everybody thing. Pornography right now in our country is the biggest moneymaker. It makes more money than professional football, professional basketball, professional baseball, professional hockey, all combined times three. Pornography makes more money. So what does the devil do? No one's going to know. What happens in secret stays a secret. When do people look at pornography? Like, it's not like you're walking out on Christmas morning. Hey, grandma, look at this. I was talking to a young man at one of these conferences a few years ago. He came up after a men's talk again. He says, you know, you know, I realized every time I lock my door to look at pornography and to masturbate, I'm locking out God. And I looked at him and I said, you don't understand. It's not like when you go to sin that God abandons you. He's still right there with you. But you have to invite him into your heart, man. Like the door you're locking is the door to your heart. Like, have you been a confession? No, I'm too ashamed to go. And see, that's where the devil gets us. The devil makes us believe that we are so dirty, we're so wrong, we're so disgusting, 
especially if you've confessed this sin or other sins a hundred times. Well, he can't, he can't forgive me again. He can't forgive me again. And God says, yes, I will. The only sin I won't forgive is the one you don't ask forgiveness for. And I want to say to any soul in this room who has not been able to go to confession yet, hasn't taken the time yet, especially if you're trapped and locked inside that room with darkness and with guilt and with shame, whether it's pornography or masturbation or whatever the sin is, any kind of addiction, that the only, the only sin he will not forgive is the one you don't ask forgiveness for. That he's waiting. He's waiting to pick you up again, waiting to make you new, waiting to say the most beautiful three words that exist in all of humanity. The most beautiful three words in humanity are not, I love you. The most beautiful three words in humanity are, I absolve you. When the priest of God raises his hand over your head and says, through the power of the church that's given and entrusted to these men through Jesus Christ, I absolve you from your sins and you are forgiven and you go in peace. Because God wants you to have life and have it abundantly, John 10, 10, that he came to save you, that the goal of our faith, 1 Peter 1, 9, is salvation. The goal of our faith is not just to have a feely good, feely good Jesus pep rally with bad t-shirts. <laughs> I'm just kidding. Oh, stop it. <laughs> that Jesus came, why? For salvation. You gotta wrap your heads around this. Look at the cross. You know, it's funny. The sign above his head, INRI, it says Jesus Christ, King of the Jews. It says that in Hebrew, Latin, and Greek. That's what it says in scripture. Jesus Christ, King of the Jews. The sign above his head said who he was. But it's what he did with his body and what he didn't do that proclaimed whose he was. And he was broken upon that cross. Why? Wrap your heads around this. Because you have a God who loves you so much that he would rather die than risk spending eternity without you. I'm going to say that again. You have a God who loves you so much, he would rather die, the most gruesome death known to man, than risk spending eternity without you. But see, what ends up happening is we get trapped, and sin blinds us, and sin deafens us. You know, what, you know what sin's like? You know when you're laying in bed in the morning, and you're going to be late to school, and you just keep hitting snooze? You're underneath the cold blanket. you got the cold pillow. The shades are done. It's dark in the room. You're like, oh, this is nice. Just another five minutes, just another 10 minutes. And all of a sudden, your mom's like, Billy, get down there. You're like, oh, I can't hear you. I'm, 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 not, I'm not your son. I'm an orphan. You know, run away. <laughs> and she comes up, <laughs> Billy, you're like, just go away. Go away, mother. And it opens the door. Light goes on. Mattress gets kicked. Eventually, they bring in a team of movers and they throw you onto the ground. <laughs> see, that's what sin is. You see, the church is our mother, and our mother's calling out to us. Saying, get down here. Get out of the tomb. Come on, come live your life. Come live an abundant life. I'm more comfortable this way. It's dark in here. I'm comfortable. No one's challenging me. No one's calling me out. I don't have to do anything. I'm so comfortable. And the church says, no, you're not living. If you're trapped in sin, you're not living. You're breathing. The reason that we have so much pain and sadness and suffering is we walk around and we're not in a state of grace. God's life, we're in a state of disgrace because we're so ashamed to admit it. We're ashamed to walk up to another sinner. And yes, the priest is holy as they are. They're sinners too. To walk into and sit down across from another sinner who's speaking in the person of Christ. At mass, you didn't hear father say, this is his body. He says, this is my body. He's speaking, it's called impersona Christi Capitus. It's my body. That's why in confession, he doesn't say Jesus absolves you. He says, I absolve you because he's speaking in the person of Christ. You are sitting with Jesus. He just looks like a priest. If there's any soul in this room who has been, who's been afraid to go to confession because of that guilt, that shame, that fear. I've been there. I understand. Don't do it. You're shackling yourself. You're shackling yourself to a lack of joy, to hopelessness, to misery. Don't walk. Run back to confession. Run into that room. And if you're like, oh gosh, it's so awkward. You know, I'm going to go to this priest. Like I understood. When I was in grade school, I went to the suburban grade school. I, I was doing my, my confession in fourth grade. And the priest, like, oh, you just come over to our, our house for dinner and stuff. He's like really good friends with my parents. Then we tried to look all holy that night every time he come. We so weren't. He came over and like, I was so worried he was gonna recognize my voice. I didn't understand like priests can't share this stuff. I was in fourth grade. I was so afraid he was gonna recognize my voice. I, made, I did a Rastafarian accent. <laughs> like, Bless me, Father, for I have sinned, man. <laughs> we didn't have any Jamaican students in our school. <laughs> Wish we had. Like, I was like, it was so stupid. We play all these stupid little games. I'd say, I don't know, I don't know what your sins are. I know what mine are. But you know what? I'll tell you something. Like, God 
He says to the the Corinthians, like, God made you a temple. Like, do you understand that the Eucharist is the greatest affirmation of you that you'll ever see or experience? God doesn't look at you just as 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 a person. He looks at you as a temple, sacred and good and holy and set apart. And when we mess up, he gives us a way to get back in right relationship because he wants us to be a temple. And where, where, does the, where does God dwell? God dwells in the temple. That's why he gives us the Eucharist. You are a walking tabernacle. But that's also why the church says, hey, you know what? If you got some sin you got to deal with, get to confession and get that worked out so that you can restore the temple. Can be filled with God's life and God's grace again before you receive the Eucharist. And if you're thinking, you know, gosh, God's just got to be so disappointed in me. I know I speak on behalf of the priests. They are so humbled and so happy and so joyful when a sinner comes home. When you come and sit down, you have the guts and the courage to act from your heart, not to hide in the shame, not to flee, not to, not to hide like Adam and Eve, not to lock yourself in, but to go forward humbly, boldly, courageously. They're humbled by that. This is why they got ordained. They want to hear this. And there's nothing you can say that they haven't heard. But in that moment, people go forward and say, yeah, I, I'm struggling with pornography. I'm really, I'm struggling with masturbation. I got to break the cycle of sin. And the only way to break that is with God's help. Yes, you need to have accountability. You need to have guys and girls in your life who will walk with you. But the first step is you got to get to confession. You got to get in right relationship. And then you have to learn how to stay in right relationship. But they're not going to be ashamed of you. They're not going to be upset with you. I'll say as a father, I've got four kids. I've got three daughters and a son. And when my kids screw up, I don't love them less. But when they take ownership, even if they've screwed up, it makes me proud. It makes me proud. Like they get it. I came home from work a few years ago. My son at the time was four years old. I walked by an activity set. This is what I saw. <laughs> yeah. You know, like, you're like, yeah, I'm just you're walking by, like peripheral vision. I'm like, Simon Peter Parker, what's going on? <laughs> and I'm like, Josiah! Yeah, Dad, Josiah, get in here! Because I'm like, Hey, buddy, good to see you, buddy. <laughs> What's this? <laughs> and he looks up at me. And he says, well, we had an accident. I said, what was the accident? He said, I broke the baby Jesus. <laughs> and then he reaches into his pocket, and his lip is quivering, and his hand's shaking. And he pulls out this little baby Jesus who now has one arm. So instead of Jesus usually doing this, he's just doing this. <laughs> and I got, down, I got down on the ground, and he was like, he was quivering. I took him, I held him real close. I went in his ear and said, idiot. No, I'm just kidding. (laughs) No, of course I didn't. Am I sadistic? No, I whispered in his ear. I said, buddy, I said, I'm so proud of you. I'm so proud of you. He's like, for breaking Jesus? I said, no, I'm not proud for that part. (laughs) See, incidentally, this is why we have five nativity sets, because that always happens. I said, no, I'm proud of you, dude, because you owned it, man. Because we all screw up and you're going to screw up in life. But you have to understand, if you come to me as your father and you're honest with me, I'm always going to forgive you because no matter what you do, there's nothing you can do that's going to make me love you more and nothing you can do is going to make you love you less. And that's what God says to you. There's nothing you can do. You can pray 42 rosaries a day backwards in Latin. And while that's awesome and tricky, God's not going to love you less. He's not. He's not going to love you more because you prayed like this and less because you didn't pray. No. But if you, if you can be strong enough, trusting enough, humble enough to walk forward and own it and say, Jesus, I've tried this my way and I, just, I, cannot, I cannot break this cycle. It's got a hold of me. See, because the evil wants to take something good and twist it. Like our bodies are good. God makes us good. It says, it says in Genesis, we're made in his image and likeness. We're good. And your bodies are designed to worship. So you can use your body to lead you to heaven or to lead you to hell. You can use your body to draw closer to God or to push him away. And how you use your body is up to you. Last night, sister was up here. The band's up here. And and they're they're calling us to worship. And she's inviting us, can you open your hands? Would you willing to open your hands? Would you willing to extend your hands? You think about how many times we use words to tear people down versus to build them up. Your body is a temple of the Holy Spirit. Do you know the word profanity means outside the temple? Profanum? Outside the temple. It means it has, place, has no place inside of a church. But more to the point, it means profanity, cussing, bad language has no place inside of you because you're a son of God or a daughter of God. 
That God looks at you and says, you are a temple. That's how sacred you are. That's how holy you are. That's how important you are to me. And I designed you for great things. And I designed you to lead others to me. The creator uses creation to point creation back to the creator. And if we're trapped in sin, we're not leading anybody anywhere except to ourselves or toward hell. And I'm not just speaking to the teens because there are adults in this room who struggle with pornography or masturbation or addiction or any of their myriad of sins because all of us have our stuff and none of us are perfect. But praise God that he would give us a church and a priesthood who says you don't have to live like this. You can break the the chains. You can break the cycle. You can live in freedom. You can be happy. You can be holy. But you got to put in the effort. You got to take the step. You got to let faith move you. You got to act from your heart in a courageous way. That'd be really easy for us to stand up here and turn a blind eye and be like, there's no such thing as porn. Everything's hunky-dory. How is that going to help anybody? And this really is just a Jesus pep rally. But if you really want to live, if you want to be transformed, then look at how you use your body. Do I use my body to bring glory to God? Do I use my body to lead others to God? Do I use my body and serve in ways? Do I worship and serve? Do my words build up or tear down? Do I try to draw people's attention to me or to him? These are the questions that need to be answered. And ultimately, if you really, really want the life that you so deeply desire, a life that that pornography promises but never delivers on, if you want to live in joy and in peace and in freedom, it starts with Jesus. But it starts with you. You got to go to him, like that woman with the hemorrhage. You got to go in faith and in trust and reach out and clutch. See, we are so busy clutching the robes of false gods, like porn, that we never actually clutch the robe of the one and true God, Jesus Christ. He is waiting in the sacrament. He's waiting. And he's not afraid of your sin. He's not afraid of your darkness. He's not afraid of your shame or your guilt. He comes right into the mess. He wasn't born in a pediatric unit at a children's hospital. He was born in a feed box. He's not afraid of your mess. So wherever you are right now, I'm just going to ask you to take a second, close your eyes. Don't distract the person next to you. Think of your whole body as a form of prayer right now. Every movement, just to quietly not distract. Now I'm going to ask you, in a spirit of trust and courage and boldness, just to open your hands in front of you. To open your hands in front of you. This is just an outward sign of an interior posture. Think of your open hands as a sign of an open heart. 